Hey, everybody. Welcome to Habitat Now. I'm your host, Aaron Shea, and it is an incredible honor to have a celebrity join us from Netflix. Many of you have seen the season three of Blown Away. Hope you have. If not, pause this, go watch it, and come back because we have John Moran, who was victorious on this up this last season. Um, because of it, we're celebrating him in the gallery with an exhibition called We Are Blown Away. I'll cover that a bit. But he's joining us today for his Not Grandma's Glass NGG presentation of 2022. He was uh, th the th one of the four winners of 2021 with his presentation. You can see it on the Not Grandma's Glass website. You can watch his talk on YouTube. It was super powerful, very emotional. I remember it uh, vividly talking about his work and his career. And I'm honored to have you join us today, John. So I'll get back into that. Let me go through some housekeeping of stuff that's going on. I'm going to take over your screen with my screen and you'll see our little logo here. That's what I always put first so I know where to start. Clickety click, come on robot. All right, so if you haven't seen it yet, the Glass Art Fair is online. An incredible collection of members of our Habitat family offering work directly from their studios. It is an honor to have so many talented people in my world that I've known for years and some new people and we've even deviated outside of glass a little bit. An artist named Carrie Side is on there who does um, works in steel and plexi. And we've done well with her work too. So we'll be continuing this. This is the third year of the show. Just amazing treasures available. I've gotten some amazing compliments this year um, from people who are experiencing this for the first time. Check it out. We have an upcoming Masterworks auction. Um, I'm trying my hardest to get up and running and I'm very close to finishing. I've just assigned... My two employees, Andrew and uh, Regina today, to button up the rest of the details. It will be a 71-piece auction, all online, all virtual. A lot of the, all the works are in the gallery. Come and see them. It is going to be something to knock your socks clean off. And if you have work you want to consign, things that you've acquired that you no longer uh, fit your aesthetic, blah, 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 give me a call. We'll talk. We have some space left, but very little left on the glass uh, art fair or the glass cruise we've... Uh, scheduled for next year. I don't think I'll be going on. I've tried my best to, to squeeze on that cruise ship, but I've, I've given up my space for other people. So definitely Ferd and Kathy will be there. It, it is going to be a wonderful time. Come and see the shows. We have uh, Deanna Clayton's solo exhibition and Stephanie Trenchard's solo exhibition. Both have been selling well and we have, and there's plenty of work le left and it's an amazing thing to see. Lots of color, very feminine. Check out the work anytime. Uh, this month, we have two exhibitions uh, opening on the 25th, I believe, so or maybe 26th, whatever that Friday is after Thanksgiving. I think it's the 25th. Michael Barron's solo exhibition. He's got a, an um, incredible collection of work, along with celebrating 30 years of collaborating with artist Tomas Helvichka from the Czech Republic. Many of you know him. His daughter is an artist. His fa father-in-law was Pava Halava. So we're doing a retrospective. And now we're planning for the international. We've moved it to gas. Our invitations have gone out to some of the artists. We're sending out more. It's going to be a heck of a time. If you're not here, then I don't know why you're bothering being on the Zoom. And now we're on to uh, the Not Grandma's Glass presentation. Many of you are aware this is our second year and our third year is coming up. And as an exclusive for being here today, you get the first glimpse of the 2023 artists who are invited to the show. They actually invited these artists earlier in the summer and got responses from them. And they're from a variety of backgrounds and all of them are incredibly talented. I'm just excited about season three of Not Grandma's Last as I am of season two, as I am of season one. And you'll see on the bottom, the winners of this year will be part of that show in the last four months, just like John is today. So all that aside, John, thank you for joining me today. I'd like to welcome you. Um, I love your logo. It's so close to MGG. It's like we were <laughs> trained together to plan. Uh, yours is probably way older, though, which is which is great to see. You do sell T-shirts with this logo on it, right? I have to get yeah, one. Yeah. To get one. I have to get a tie. You can sell ties, I hope. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> so thank you, John, for being here. Uh, for those that you don't know and haven't seen it, I know Ray has seen it. You've been here. I know John has seen it. But everybody's welcome to come see John Moran's exhibition here mm -hmm. at the gallery. It is a spectacular collection of his work, very powerful moving pieces. Every piece has a plaque explaining what and why, and these are museum quality works. And I'm hoping someday soon to get John an, an exhibition in the museum slash MGG, and we'll talk more about that soon. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I could find that button and I'll invite John to say hi, join us, John. Hey everybody, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me, Aaron, and thanks everybody for joining. 
Uh, yeah, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, figure this out again. Yeah, figure it out. John's gonna cover some fun things, including a little bit of time on Blown Away, some of the exhibition, and we're really gonna be here to talk about his uh, his most well known series, which is what I'm most excited about too. So, thank you yeah. again for joining us. Uh, Aaron, I oh, have did I have to enable it? Is it my fault? It's totally my fault, isn't it? There we go. Enabled sharing. So I'm going to go through some of the works that are actually in the exhibition. So like not in too much in detail, but if you have any questions, please do feel free to ask. Hey, here's John. We're outside the gallery. Looking good, buddy. Yeah. Looking you. good. Uh, I'm just trying to get rid of that. Can you see the screen good? Yep, I can see it great. All right, so this is the, why are you showing it like that? One second, sorry. Fit height. Go on to fit height, okay. Um, yeah, so the show that is up at Habitat right now is a collection of works from probably about the last uh, like seven or eight years. Uh, quite a big collection of work. Some new pieces that are in the show, uh, like this piece, Pray for the Sinners. Um, I made this piece for the NGG of 2021 and there's a lot of uh I have a lot of talks about this throughout the the kind of uh throughout my presentation so I won't go into it too much but I'll just talk a little bit about it that it's based on Donatella's David um it's very much connected to a personal story um that I I had with the friend and something I remember growing up um and talking a little bit about like kind of power abuse and power struggles and something that kind of came uh, alive throughout COVID, but the piece is kind of a full-size child. Uh, it's sculpted glass body parts and then made with mixed media to kind of piece the piece together. This this work is actually on display. We have it actually taller than most people. It is kind of it's kind of impressive to see because you really drink the whole thing in because of the scale. It's a, it's a it's a great it's a great and meaningful work. I love it. Yeah, these works. I think to see them together in the in the exhibition was really nice because they they do they all relate. Like, there's a story that's kind of there's a thread that goes through a lot of my work, and uh, a lot of it has to deal with like innocence or innocence lost, and a lot of talking about like politics and you know, or not necessarily like general politics, but the political spectrum of our society uh, in general. Um, this is another piece in the show called Bright Eyes. Uh, it's about it's, it's a little bit based on the ongoing war we've had uh, in the Middle East and specifically mostly dealing with like the drone attacks and the dehumanization of war. So uh, it's a piece of a, a, a plaque explaining it there in the gallery. And um, again, I've talked about this one in the past, so I won't go to too much detail on it. Um but another piece that's in the show that uh, is one that I, I haven't talked about so much called Our Lady. And this piece is based on the Vestal Virgins, like the uh, the, the pose of it. So it's, she has kind of the, the colors of the Virgin Mary built into her. But what it was really a re reaction was, was I made this piece shortly after moving to um, in, into Europe. Um, there was a, a in, in Cologne in like 2014 or 2015, there was a, a uh, New Year's Eve party. And supposedly there was a lot of like uh, Middle Eastern men or uh, Muslim men who had touched women. There was this big stink in the in the in the um, in the news and in the media. But the way that it turned into was like the politicians being like, "Well, these people shouldn't touch our women." And the whole thing was kind of blown up, like it wasn't something that had happened and was so serious. Or it was a few people, but it wasn't you know this big cultural phenomenon it was made out to be but the way that the politicians took over and pimped ownership of the women was something that i found to be like quite a part of our like yeah our society so this piece was made in reaction to that that like we claim ownership of the women when we're trying to protect them rather than it being like uh, about uh like yeah about equality or about um what the whole conversation should have been about um and i've Another piece that, that's that's in the show that I think you can see this thread that goes between the work because a lot of it deals with what's happening in our contemporary society pretty much at any given point in time. And now this piece is based on the shooting of Philando Castile. It's uh, called Protect and Serve. Um, and we know the story of the shooting. And I made this piece pretty shortly after uh, the shooting had happened. And it's just an interesting thing because I've recently been giving a lot of presentations about my work in the U.S. and in the current state of the U.S. where our identity, our identity politics and um, the idea of like 
uh, a white person making work about black trauma was brought up to me. And I just, my response to that was kind of like, well, at the time when I was making these works, there was so little discussion about what was happening. Like the Black Lives Matter movement was really just starting to come to life because of these, these things that were happening. It was really starting to become a, a mainstream media uh, element. So like now I would approach these works differently because the conversation has changed so much and it is starting to lean towards a much more like equitable society, or at least we're trying to find that. And that's a big part of the, the major discussion. But at the time that a lot of these works were made, they're made in a reaction to what's actually going on at the time, not about something that's happened very recently. This right. piece and, is one of those. I, and I, I, you have a, a personal reaction that makes you create as an artist. And this is yeah, what comes from it. Most of my work is a reaction to like a direct, um, it's like a direct uh, reaction to a situation. And this piece is, is again, one of these pieces called When You Wish. Uh, it's a similar it comes from around the same period of the Black Lives Matter, like the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movements where there was a lot of violence against black youth. And this was about a young girl whose brother was killed uh, by the police, kind of in an accidental shooting, but the way that she remembers her brother is in this kind of a uh, being killed by the police. So this was a piece that was supposed to kind of just bring this kind of emotion of this trauma to life um, and to kind of get us to be aware of like the people that, that uh, are affected by these things. It's not just about the victims or the the perpetrators, but about everyone whose lives are affected in these these events. Um, one of the other pieces that this is kind of the first time that this piece is, has actually been on display is called uh, "When a Clock" or the second time, but "When a Clock Strikes 12. Um, this piece is all glass. It's about three and a half feet tall. Um, it's again a little bit of a uh, it's a conversation piece about what's happening again in our society, but taking it again from like a kind of a different background. Um, a lot of my work, like I pull this imagery from like Disney or from this kind of fantastical idea that sometimes like in our lives, we have this, there's this reality that we all live, but we also like to sugarcoat things. And uh, I like to play with that sugarcoating idea a little bit. So this piece is kind of based on, Cinderella and when that moment in Cinderella like this the story that this you know basically a poor child has no way of getting out of her poor you know upbringing unless there's a fairy godmother and a prince charming to save her. <laughs> and it was just this idea that like this is what what this is what's needed in order to pull out of this so this piece was kind of a, a like a lighthearted like you know, push at this using some of the like kind of my dark humor as part of the the idea behind this piece. So even the title, the A Clock Strikes Twelve, is supposed to have kind of a reference to this, you know, like physical nature of like what the 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 difference in like a historical context of was between men and women as well. So um another piece in the show that again touches on these like kind of Disney references. This piece is called uh, a worthy component, a worthy opponent. And uh, it's the, the idea of the boy is taken from the Lost Boys of Peter Pan, this kind of fantasy idea that we never grow up, but uh, there's always a dark side to these things. Um, so this piece is, yeah, I, I've talked about it also in a recent presentation, so I won't go too much into it, just show a few images. And again, say it's really worth seeing all these pieces together in the gallery. It's really, it was nice for me to see because I've never seen them all together. That was kind of interesting. I've seen them all at different places around the world and in my studio, but never as one collection. Um, one of the other pieces that's there that's, I think, again, it's about a very specific moment in time, but then it becomes kind of a universal period. This piece is called Loathing and Fear. And uh, I really like this one because it was, I made it right around the time that Trump was really trying to sell his wall to us, like that we needed to wall ourselves in and kind of build this, this uh, protective society. But at the same time, we're building this wall, we're kind of closing ourselves in um, as people. And what's interesting for me now is like living in Europe is that there's a lot of this, uh, there's a lot of xenophobia right now and there's a lot of like really closed culture. But at some point when you really close yourself in, you pretty much lock yourself in and you're stuck and you can't get out. And that was the, the, uh, the kind of playfulness of this piece. But the pose itself is actually modeled after um, this sculpture by Marito Catalan where he's, it's a sculpture of him breaking into a museum. And it's basically like his only, it was kind of a joke that like his only way to ever get into a collection would be to break into the museum. So using this kind of like idea of like breaking into something, but at the same time being stuck in it was 
yeah, it made sense to me in my head. And it was a playful, playful turn on this, this idea of being walled in, in a way as if you're escaping, but at the same time, it's a wall we've built ourselves. Hmm. Um, this is another one of the pieces this, that's in the show. Uh, it, it is now part of Aaron's collection. It is called uh, Searching for Sleepy. It was a bit of a self-portrait. Um, when I was coming, when I was coming up in the glass world, when I was first starting, uh, I got, I used to work night shift at UPS and I would go to class every day and blow glass, but I would also be kind of a narcolept. So I'd like fall asleep pretty consistently and during the day. And I got this nickname sleepy and it stuck with me for like 24 years. <laughs> and when I was, when I just moved over to Europe or I was in Europe for quite a while at that point, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do with my next point in my life. So this piece was kind of a, a fun little uh, uh, self-portrait uh, called, yeah, Searching for Sleepy. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, hazily searching in the eve in the night, like looking for where you're going next, but almost about to topple over and fall asleep. This is this is one of the two self-portraits I want. I got I got yours, and I'm going to get Dean Allison's. He has a self-portrait, too, called yeah. Something Comedy. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have those two someday together. <laughs> it would be good, good together with each other. Mm-hmm. And this piece is one of the, the, this is called a true icon. And I'll talk about little, like quite a bit more later about the Mickey Mori series. But like, this is one of the earliest um, renditions of the piece where it was actually taking on a full figurative base. Um, a lot of them now go between like either, either figures or the skulls, just the actual uh, head. And um, the whole thing has become like kind of a surrogate for like these different ideas. Um, started in one place, which was very much the basis for this piece, which is the idea of, it's like iconic uh, character that's become so, so like a part of everybody's lives. Like he's ubiquitous. We all know Mickey Mouse, but like any even thought of like using an image of Mickey Mouse is like met with the fear of being sued and this litigiousness that Disney brings to, to that. But um, that's where this kind of sparked this idea that that's turned into the Mickey Mori series, which I will go into depth later. So I won't talk too much about this one now. This piece, I think, is, is also about two and a half feet tall, is fully hot assembled glass uh, piece. No mixed media in this one and no mixed media in the last one, which is very rare for me. I'm typically a mixed media person. Um, this is one of the big pieces that's on display. This is probably the largest piece I've ever made. It's uh, called New Times Roman. And I can say for me still, it's one of my most impressive pieces. It's one of my favorites. Um, the body parts in this entire sculpture are made of glass. And then the piece is assembled with a metal skeleton, uh, layers of epoxy paste or epoxy putty that's like a hard plastic, and then covered in fabric and an epoxy resin. So everything has a, a hard shell around it and is sculpted to kind of resemble the Pieta of Michelangelo. Again, this is one I've gone into the, the, uh, the history of and the uh, concepts behind many times, so I won't talk about it too much, but I wanted to show the image because I think it's one of the the pieces that's really important to see in the exhibition if you're able to go make it. And uh, this is what Aaron and I were talking about a little earlier. This is one of the new pieces that's going to be, it is uh, released called Spilt. It's part of the Habitat Limited series. Um, it's about teacup size and it's a hand, each one is individually sculpted, individually enameled, individually gold leafed. And it's loosely based off of Chip from, um, from Beauty and the Beast. And again, playing with this idea of like, the kind of forgotten fantasy or the fantasy of uh of disney and and are kind of like for me at least a lot of times like my you know, fantastical view of like what our reality is and what we believe is like the uh the myth of like you know the american myth of success or like the myth of where we're living a lot of these pieces were coming out during covid where I was we were stuck in looking inward a lot and then trying to figure out where we we're going from there so this kind of perception of reality had shifted. And this piece is actually much, again, based on loss of innocence or about violence, but brought in a very different and kind of lighthearted way. But this collection is now available through Habitat Limited series. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to interrupt. Um, so that's the entire show right now that's up at Habitat. So you can check it out in person. It's I think it's a it's a good one and i just wanted to touch because a lot of people ask a lot about some of the experiences on blown away so i just wanted to show a couple of images from there and go into a little bit of depth because i think a lot of this 
like the way that I, I approach a lot of work. I'm just showing some images of all of the people there because we had so much fun together. It wasn't just a, uh, it wasn't just a bunch of us working in blowing gas in the competition. We hung out a lot, but um, what became like, what's in a lot of my work that doesn't always come out or doesn't always come through is like the, the, the thought or the content behind it. And it's kind of something that runs through all of the work that I make. So some of the pieces that were on the show that I didn't really get a chance to talk about so much on the show that people have asked about, just wanted to give some ideas what there was more depth in there. And I think that helps later when you, when you see other work that I make to kind of see how I approach conceptual ideas and then hopefully open up conversations that the work's about. Uh, this was the first piece that was made uh, on the on the show. It's called it's called Just Like Him. This piece was we had to make a piece about one of the challenges we faced as an artist and how we've been shaped by that, or challenges we faced in our lives, and how it shaped us as an artist. And this piece was about my father dying, and it was a memento mori made about like basically his death, and all of these elements were like memories of that evening, uh, or like things that came from his life. So he had uh, died of a heart attack when he was young. He was 38 years old. And my memory of him was he loved to play basketball, even though he was not like a basketball player by any means, but he liked to play. So this idea of this deflating basketball was kind of representative of a heart. Um, he was a late night person as well, like much like I am. And he didn't, he didn't drink alcohol and he don't think he drank coffee, but he drank Coke, Coca-Cola. So this candle in the background is like the, the burned down candle, which is like a reference to the Memento Mori paintings where it's like the, a, a life that's nearly completed from like the candle burning down but the colors and the shape are loosely based on the coca-cola bottle and coca-cola references so it was kind of reference to that staying up late at night then the life burn short and then the flowers are lilies uh and there's 38 leaves which represent the the years of his lives there's three flowers which is my sister siblings and myself um again i'm going to go through these relatively quickly but just try to give some insight into the things that people ask me about through the through the show and give an idea of what what the uh how i approach conceptual ideas um this piece is called across the void it was one of the pieces we had to make that was specifically about uh, how glasses impacted our lives and one of the things i thought about was the the smartphone and like how we kind of look into this mirror even though it's a way of connectivity that pretty much without like smartphone technology, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing now. But at the same time, it's this void we can get lost into. So this piece was supposed to have this kind of double-endedness about it, that it was this mirror we're looking into where you don't see anything reflecting, but it's being held like a cell phone. But even though it's it's kind of about distance, the two hands are coming together of two different colors, so it's unity. So it's really a play back and forth of this idea. And it was supposed to be based on a Victorian mirror because it's kind of the height of like what we see as like vanity. So like this vanity that exists within a cell phone, but at the same time, it's creativity. And at the same time, it's um, like disassociation from each other, but and connectivity. So it was this kind of like amalgamation of all of the above. Um, I put this piece in here. Uh, this piece is called If the Shoe Fits because this is kind of the, this piece was about the, we had to do the seven deadly sins challenge where they asked us to pick a sin and then like bring it to life. And this kind of inspired the series of Mickey Morris that I have presented today. So I just wanted to talk about, to bring this into it just a little bit and talk about it uh, just to kind of reference where I come from later with the other pieces. Um, this piece was definitely much more serious in nature than the, the Mickey Morris are. They're kind of poking fun at the idea of the deadly sins. And this piece was illustrating greed and it was about the idea that, I mean, I, I picked a, 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 um, an athletic shoe because so many of the companies that like, that like sponsor, um, sponsor athletics or that uh, make shoes, there's been always criticism that they're like made in sweatshops and there's these big profits coming to the companies. And it's kind of built on the backs of like poorer people. So it was this idea of like this kind of white skin shoe taking over and kind of stomping on this pillow. So again, like referencing the Cinderella motif as like a glass slipper, but then being like very much twisted and kind of uh, darker in that in that sense to kind of talk about that idea of greed. I'm showing this one because it's pretty much a fan favorite. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't don't just fly soar, but soar is spelled S O R E. Um, we had to do a piece that was talking about the circus, and I chose to represent the political circus 
Uh, I didn't name any names. It was a little bit of a caricature. Uh, funny, funny piece made simply to kind of have a laugh with the system. Of course, there's critical there's critique to it, but it's not um, it's not hyper in depth like a lot of the work I make. But it was, I think, this playful um, element exists throughout a lot of my work. Like I go back, I oscillate back and forth between like very heavy in depth, like large scale pieces, and then I try to play. And it's kind of lighthearted, uh, like satirical pieces, because I think satire is a really important way of starting a conversation. It's one of my favorite methods of like political discussion is through satire. I got a question for you about that piece. Um, it's a light question. Um, I know like they give you a topic, got to come up with an idea, and then you go, have you ever made an elephant before? Was that like the first one you ever made? I've made an elephant before, but not like, definitely not like this. Like, I think yeah. it's been a long time. So I, <laughs> and if I made one, they definitely didn't look so elephanty. It's like, it's like, it's like you did a good job making it elephanty without much yeah. elephanty experience. <laughs> yeah, and it was, I, I think I had more experience sculpting satire than I did elephants. That's for sure. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, yeah, we, the, there's an, the, one of the other pieces that I think that was, for me, it was really an important piece on the show is we had to express like our biggest fear. And uh, it was weird to open up about this on like Netflix in front of who knows how many millions of people who saw it. But um, one of the things this piece is really uh, representational, it's called um, the, the end result is uh, like our struggle as artists that like we have this desire and this like drive to continue to work and to put ourselves out there and a lot of times we fail and it becomes this kind of like um, thing where you kind of have to pick yourself up over and over again. But so many of us in the community and through different things know of people who weren't able to pick themselves up again and again. And that's kind of one of my biggest fears is that like at some point the whole, the, the drive gets tiring and yeah, it's something that was quite weird to, to put out on Netflix. It's not something they actually talked about really so much because a lot of us made very heavy uh, fears. I think they were expecting us to talk about spiders or the dark, and then we all went really pretty in-depth about what our real fears were. Mm. And this piece where I kind of tried to find that was to show this emotion of the bird that had, you know, tried to build this home out of basically its, its own heart, like the things it poured into it, and then tried to fly and couldn't, and then ended up, you know, at the bottom of the, the ravine. But all of the, like the, the color marks and the texture is all very intentional. And it's really meant to be in like a relation to Vincent van Gogh. Uh, so it's supposed to have this kind of painterly look and reference the textures that are within his work because he's kind of the, the, like the epitome of the quote unquote starving artist who was discovered after he died or, you know, after he killed himself. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of us, us artists live with. It's something that we've we talk about a lot, but not usually so openly. And it was a little bit odd to put it out on Netflix. And then something that people have asked me a lot about because it's resonated with a lot of people. And uh, I think it's just because it's something that we don't typically discuss a lot. It's a very powerful piece. I remember you working really hard on this one in the show. And it was a very small piece. The bird is smaller than life size. It was about five hours of sculpting this little bird. Um, and then this just leads to the to the final piece because one of the things that was like that was a very dark like i mean even for myself emotionally i went down the rabbit hole in that last piece and then to come like from what comes from that uh like where do we go from there and this was kind of my final installation in the show it's actually up at corning right now so if you're there it's it's quite i think it looks really great they've installed it very nicely i haven't seen it in person yet but and i have very hazy memories of doing it on the show because it was a scramble obviously but what the idea was supposed to be was that like in this empty space, this kind of like false space of a gallery that we can, we can find new life or, I mean, the finding new life was kind of a, uh, in reference to the final piece that like, no matter what happens, we can grow from that and um, yeah, transform into bigger and better things. But the whole piece used the actual like facade of the, the white gallery space as a crux because we weren't supposed to necessarily fill the gallery but we're supposed to use the space that was part of the installation and i pretty much ended up making one of the smallest pieces i think the smallest piece that's ever been done is their final show but just to use that to kind of create a, a small space there that you would find this little oasis of life um here is one of the little little elements of oasis <laughs> and i think this was probably the most powerful element of the of the uh, entire installation 
But as they kind of, as Kathy said, there was no way I could have just put this in. I think they would have not accepted that as the final, <laughs> final right. piece. It's definitely, um, a, definitely a, a powerful piece, and you definitely came up with a, an amazing idea that led to success, man. Congratulations again. And from this leads to the last two little things. It's like, yeah, just wanted to say again, like we did have a blast on the show. Like even though we're in a competition, it's like that. But it has led to an entire series of new work that I've been kind of making since I, I came off of the show. And I'm kind of pretty pretty much been consistently working on a lot of new things. But I've been playing with this idea for quite some time, which is the Mickey Mori series. Um, I, I talked a little bit about in True, True Icon, the, the full figure feast. But um, what the the real, like, where the idea comes from is this, like, this childhood memory of of mickey mouse and like him being this kind of iconic figure that we all talked about and like i said it, it, disney like i have this like love hate relationship with disney like i love disney movies and i love the idea of the fantasy behind it but i'm very like fascinated by the fact that like this like mickey mouse specifically was like a copyright that was done by one person and founded by one person it was the idea of the trademark of walt disney and when he died, that, that copyright should have lasted only a few years. But instead, like, the Disney Corporation found a way to own that. And once the co corporation owned it, it was able to gain that and have the life of a corporation. And then once that copyright should have ended, it was extended again and again and again. And almost now, I believe it's going to end in 2023. But it's been almost 100 years of the copyright. And what I find really fascinating about that is that Disney is one of those companies, one of those things that literally goes out and, like, culturally appropriate stories turns them into like very marketable disneyfied uh you know movies and then sues anyone that tries to use them even as recently as the movie uh coco they tried to trademark the dia de los muertos it's like the saying so that that could not be used and this is like a cultural saying for mexico so it's not like this is an old phenomenon this is done and it's still happening now so this entire series grew from that um, so the idea of the Mickey Mori is a little bit of a joke, a little bit of a death to Mickey, like death to this idea of the copyright. Um, so this series has grown into lots of different things. Uh, from... Oops, let me get that. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. So the question. No. <laughs> and uh, the series that's, that's ha that, that I'm going to go through right now is uh, part of this. I'm going to talk about the general concept and show the images because this, this entire series is based on that idea of the seven deadly sins. So it's a playful, it's a little bit playful because I'm I'm pulling this, you know, this kind of Disney skull imagery, which is not like not everybody recognizes that the skull with his ears is a Mickey Mouse, even though it's very much Mickey Mouse like. And um, each of them is kind of is made from like different color patterns and different. It's like much more design heavy than a lot of the work I've made in the past. And it's there's um, like each of the sins, if you like kind of go into what they're about, they kind of all relate to each other. They kind of repeat almost over and over again. So I've kind of used these like different words that, that draw into the sin to kind of get what it is. And then using the old Latin uh, phrases for them. So that's the titles are in the old Latin and they are kind of referencing what, what's happening now, but it is like a, a collectible series. So each of the pieces comes with a, a certificate and uh, like certificate of authenticity, which is again like a kind of a joke certificate, and something that that uh, I think kind of ties the whole the whole works together. Um, I'm going to go through the images a little bit and just uh, touch on each one, but mostly talk about the whole series, like not only the secular septet, but the the entire Mickey Mori series, because I think that's where like it, it exists as part of an entire. It exists in the realm of my uh, entire like art process. It's not just this series stands alone. This series is part of everything that I do. These like images, like as Aaron said, I have t-shirts uh, that I do with these and I have this kind of logo that I've made over the past, make these full figures. They become like a surrogate for more than just this idea of the death of Mickey, the kind of Mickey Mori idea, but it's a kind of a character that exists in my entire artistic world. So like each element that they they come in together, they become like a part of a bigger scheme. Like this this work is almost entirely like how I support the larger work as well. Both like 
conceptually, because this is much lighter to work on in a lot of ways, even though it has this kind of heavy depth, the approach to making them and the approach to um, uh, like designing them and things is kind of more playful and is a, is a lot more relaxing compared to like making the large scale works that uh, I, I plan for months and I jump into and spend a lot of time on. So these pieces then become this kind of element of this entire world. So as you like see in the uh, in in some of the other pieces, this image will appear off and on, like the little the Mickey Mori symbol will show up in some of the other images as like a background figure, or in even the pieces that I did for NGG twenty twenty one. I use them as a surrogate for like my own uh, self and my like kind of yeah emotional state or my kind of uh, state that, that we were in as a society during COVID and trying to discover what that was about and using this as a base. So each of these uh, each of these individual skulls is a base, the colors that are brought in, the words, they all relate back to these sins. And I don't want to go through each one individually because you can find that on my, my website, all the little descriptions about them, but like it's the, it's kind of like like a trivial game like you're able to kind of decipher the different elements in there to uh bring the pieces like more to life and to bring more like kind of um conversation with them i can definitely see that the idea you see one of these it makes you talk it makes you think you know about what the relationship is that was a very interesting comment about disneyland trying to copyright that the diaz de los muertos in and for the Coco movie, I didn't hear that one at all. It's a very interesting concept. With the work you're creating, though, you're kind of like taking the form back. You know, you're saying, "Okay, I can yeah. use this too," right? Yeah, that's kind of the. It's a little bit of the 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 joke. Like that's I, like I, when I say joke, I don't mean like haha joke, but it's like this entire thing has been part of my you know art making process throughout. It is like trying to take imagery that has been more or less like usurped um by you know corporate culture mm -hmm. and then taking it back in because it's it's around us all the time like we have no control where we see these things almost at any point and uh as i said like we don't have control when they're used or when they're taken from us so to kind of take it back like that's why the certificate was made to be as it is it's intentionally like i'll see if i can if you can see it like it's embossed with the mickey mori logo it's really like scribbled out and stamped over it's a certificate like counterfeit certificate it's made to be authentic it's in the kind of disney writing and each one of them is you know made in not completely individually but there's like all the, each part of it's done individually it's stamps and embossers so it's very much about the making thing and very much about this kind of um repetition and multitude but it's also handmade and uh yeah it's a little bit of a literally taking back the images as you just said yeah I can see how much like this has affected you and you know the concept of you know like you like you said you look around and you're not you can't control what you see and you're fed these logos and these brandings and you just accept it because you have other things going on well you don't have to accept it you know that that's yeah. the thing is you, it's your reality everybody has their own i guess the term is like postmodernistic view of, of of perception and you know what what one person sees as commodity somebody else might see as, you know, a uh, danger or a painful experience. I'm sure not everybody has had a great experience at Disney World, Disneyland, but I'm sure like there's, there's stories out there. You know, you turn on the news and somebody gets hurt at a roller coaster. There's all kinds of perceptions that are, are factual. And it's, it's about that, like that, that the, the, the things between it, that like, it's a little bit of taking it back. Of course. I mean, like I said, like I, I have a love hate relationship. Like I love Disney movies. I love to enjoy them. It's the idea of the, well, how they're, how a lot of them are made. That's what, what eats me up. But the, the fact that it's become like, for me, this, this Mickey Mori has become very like iconic, like it's recognizable. I, I see people now all over the world who like send me a photo wearing one of these shirts and that's something that's become really cool because it is exactly what you just said. Like it is taking it back a little bit and feeling like some sort of ownership over the image and, and bringing that like this is an entryway into a lot of the work that I make. Like not I know that not everyone has the ability to, to buy a giant sculpture for the house, but these pieces are ways that people do enter into the world that I feel like I'm creating and become like a. A supporter of that world but also like a member of that world and i think that's really it's really cool because it's something that's happening it started quite simply and then the t-shirts have 
allowed a lot of people to kind of enter and then um, discover more and become a bigger part of the conversation as well. And and I think that's something that art is supposed to do. And I guess it's uh, it's exciting to know that it's 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 it can happen. Yeah, I I completely agree. And like the idea of supporting you and in, in the visions that you have. It, and being able to take these ideas and make them in reality. And, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's an important narrative that needs to be discussed. You know, how how this patent keeps expanding is beyond, you know, I, I'll tell you how, it's money. <laughs> it's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Disney has no problem with money. They're so focused now. It's interesting that you said that because like right now I was, I was there was a interview with uh, the guy who did um, Edward Scissorhands, Tim... Tim Burton. Uh, Tim Burton, how he'd never work for Disney again because they're so focused primarily on the superhero and the Star Wars and all these IPs or uh, yeah, intellectual properties that they now own. And they you wouldn't be able to make Nightmare for Christmas right now. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the whole concept of business, like someone, like a brilliant marketing team sat down at Disney. It's kind of like, in, in theory, how the Bible came together years later. Where they're like, okay, let's put all our, our marketing behind this mouse plan that we've owned sitting over here. It's the same thing with uh, my my kids watch um, uh, what's it called the the, the um, Sesame Street, right? Elmo was on Sesame Street like 14 years before he became pushed him out in front and made this Elmo. So it's all it's all in the marketing. It's all in the the, the business deciding what people want, what children want, and and. And it's it's kind of scary because then the money gets dumped behind that concept and it's fed to the public. And I, I turn on the TV. What's great about today, though, a little bit better than the past, is we have all these avenues of different things you can be exposed to. When I was a kid, you had you had like, you know, a cartoon channel on three channels. You were shot. One of those, you want to watch, you want to watch Gem or you want to watch, you know, another cartoon. And I was gonna watch Gem, I was gonna watch the other cartoon. But mm -hmm. now there's so much content out that our kids aren't force fed. You could almost go, you can't really do it, but you could almost go without even discovering Mickey Mouse if you, you know, you don't know the Disney Channel and and you can get right through uh, it without being exposed to that kind of thing, which is impossible when I was a child. Well, and that's one of the fascinating things, I think, like that, that Disney will, I think, I'm pretty positive Disney will let the, like Steamboat and Mickey, Mickey, uh, mouse like that specific like copyright will expire in 2023 and it's because of the advent of the internet mm -hmm. because it's so hard now to fight and so hard to like keep up with that and people have been so much like more aggressive about taking back these things and the negative press that they got about coco like mm -hmm. those things had a bigger impact than they ever would have if it wasn't for the availability of the internet yeah right. the thing that i do think about with it though a lot that i'm not i'm not like what i find still like where it's it's had like a whole different effect on us is that that idea of a corporation being able to kind of control or become a, have the rights of a person it's what's led to the situation we're in now with like citizens united and super PACs mm -hmm. and it almost entirely stemmed from that copyright law like that's been a a i mean not entirely but it's been it's been used as a as a um like a proof that like this was an allowable situation so it's it's interesting that it has like so many different it takes so many twists and turns and it's like a simple idea in a way but it's it's a whole conversation do you have any more? Do you have more slides here, John? Or is this the last one? This is the last one. This is the seventh of the seven sins. So okay, cool. Will you stop sharing your screen. I want to. Um, yes. Actually, I can probably do it for you if you want. There you go. I'm going to go ahead and take over your screen again and quickly show you the show the NGG website right here. So if you haven't been here right now, we're all the way to November, and you can see this year's members of NGG and all their presentations online right now. Previous year is up here in the archive. You can see the year before. 2021 if the button seems to work i don't know if it's, it's taking its time so it's great that the legacy continues you can see john's talk right here and you can view his exhibition right here it's still up and then john put up his own website which it links to on ngg to see the available works for the seven deadly sins he created and i would i would hope that you know i was i'm a supporter of john i own a piece of his work because i believe in him and i believe in his career and i advise you to look at his work and realize that you know, the concept of art can be beyond something pretty. There's something that makes you think. And that's the difference between art and fine art is there's a message. And I'm really honored to have you join us today, John, and talk about your work and being part of NGG. It is an incredible honor. And I'm super grateful to be part of, be part of you in my world and get to hang out with you and see you in person. But if anybody has any questions at any time, this will be placed on YouTube. So please like, subscribe, hit that bell and share this with everybody who may uh, enjoy it and loves art because... 
we all do and we all love glass art and we love artists that work in the, pushing the medium into the future which is what this show is about thank you john yeah thank you if anybody has any questions feel free to ask yeah go ahead susan go ahead hello thank you so much for this um are you free to tell me how old your constituency is um i'm trying to wrap my head around how this new generation this not your grandmother's glass makers like yourself uh and you you're definitely making works that are much more sculptural much more conceptual than what's been done 20 years ago and i would i would love to know who is buying it um well i can say that that has definitely changed since blown away that's for sure like and um it's for me i think it's been quite a different range uh like before the first show that i did with habitat um eugene bought a very political piece you almost aaron i'm i'm sorry i don't know what the heck happened go ahead <laughs> okay, yeah, no, um, but so it, besides it, the t-shirt the actual glass works the actual glass works yeah no i think that's been especially since the show it's been a, a big variety of people um okay. and i do think that like a lot of the things that i talk about resonate with people around my age because like we are like i don't know a product of the 90s where like the the pop art the the movies the music everything had this real political edge to it and i think that that's something that 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 is now like because of the I really, because of the platform of Blown Away, it's given me an opportunity to talk to more people about that. And um, I think that's opened up the visibility and that's where people have been more excited about it. But in that that age group, for sure, it would be the, the group that I see in the 30s, 40s, sometimes okay. a little bit younger. But and they can afford that. Yes, yes. And I've had people also, even recently in their, in their mid-50s come and just say that they like the bigger work and they knew they could never afford a piece and then buying one of the smaller ones because it supports bigger stuff. So it is, it is a pretty big range. Yeah, he probably told you that um, the first person I ever sold a piece to was 96 years old. <laughs> but that doesn't surprise me. People in their 80s and 90s purchasing these works, that, that sort of makes sense. It, it's a continuum. Um, but I'm really interested in finding out that younger people are actually collecting. It's yes. definitely not, I, I think it's not the same level as like, it. Uh, it's like, I'm not like in the, you know, everybody has to have a Bill Morris, everybody has to have a Lena, everybody has to jump. It's not like that. It's definitely a specific group, I think, of people, but I think there's, they're out there. It's just not as broad as the 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 other collectors a lot of times. Okay. The more decorative collector, collector work, I think. I also, I also feel there's a, uh, like, there's a different group of collectors overall. Like, if you look at the pipe world, you know, they collect in a total different manner than anything I've been aware of for, you know, as long as I've been around and I'm trying to dive into that and learn more about, you know, there's a whole community of purists who create pipes because it's pure and it's what they know, it's what the community is. But there's an, there's an, an artist in next year's NGG presentation who mentioned to me that she has hit a wall and needs to do something else to get through this wall of creating to have more of an emotional response for people. And she feels like, you know, there's more to it than it'll bring her community with her hopefully into this i call it pinch the pipe but that kind of idea so it's it's so new suzanne that we're trying to figure it out as time goes by and uh, but we know but i know personally with ngg it's it's an important part of the future whether i like it or not yeah. and this platform the thing is, is that, that i mean there's definitely way more young artists creating glass than there were 20 30 50 years ago so that keeps mushrooming i just want to know who is buying on the other end and and if you're building if you're if you're you know lamp working a small pipe, I could see that you would have a, a broad range of mm -hmm. potential buyers. If you are uh, Mika Evans and you're making a fifty thousand dollar pipe, who, who is buying that? Well, I can tell you that that's usually bought by corporations. <laughs> it's usually bought by um, like a business of some sort to market themselves. The same reason that sixty nine thousand dollar and sixty nine million dollar NFT was bought was not for the purpose of art. It was to promote the buyers saying we're, we're a diverse group of people and we want to share that divorced people can afford this kind of work and bring attention to ourselves. So in, in the pipe world, usually the pieces that sell for, not all of them, but you know over $100,000 are a, a, a conglomerate of artists that get together and make 
like a Ghostbusters car, right? And it's usually priced at like, you know, $125,000. And between you and me, it doesn't sell for that, but it sells to somebody who uses it then as a marketing for their own business. And that's mm-hmm. the high, the highest level, you know, and that's also called The Point. I had a conversation with Banjo about this because they had a show at Habitat Florida and they wouldn't price the highest end work with Jay, who was running the gallery. And so I said, look, price the highest end work wherever you want. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Probably 125,000, 2 million, whatever it is. But the other works that you want to sell, really price those in a range that could sell because the big ones are the point. And they did that. And that's what helped, you mm-hmm. know, get through the, the show they did in Florida. Um, but that, that's it's a really interesting new world that explains why these big expense pieces are created. But, you know, they get together and do this all the time. John is well known. He just did a triple collaboration with the other winners of Blown Away. You know, is it mm-hmm. is that piece for sale? I don't know. If it does, are they going to split it? I don't know. But the idea is now this is a big marketing thing they're using to create awareness for themselves. Mm-hmm. So hope that hope that helps a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys for joining me. Good to see you, Ray and Charles, and everybody else who hung out through the rest of this. This will be again will be on YouTube. Sorry for my disappearing act. My, my house just went black and white real quick, and now it's backing up. So have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll see you next week. And uh, talk you, to you soon. Bye bye. Well, thank you, everybody. Bye, John. Bye.